Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Father Stephen Thorne. I want to welcome all of you to our webinar, a first in a series of webinars from the National Black Catholic Congress. I apologize for being a little bit late, but we're all together. There are over 300 people who are connected throughout our country, from the East Coast to the West Coast, who are together for this webinar. I'm coming to you from the Catholic Center, Catholic Apostolate Center in Washington, D.C. If you have any technical difficulties during the presentation, please send us a message in your chat box on the bottom of your right screen, the bottom right of your screen, excuse me, and we will try our best to correct it. Once again, welcome on behalf of Bishop John Ricard and the entire Board of Trustees and Ms. Valerie Washington and Ms. Kim Hefner in the office. We're so happy you're here today for this webinar and our time together. A special word of welcome to my students in Philadelphia. S sit up straight, pay attention. I'm very happy to have all of you here today for our webinar. Before I begin anything else today, I want to begin with prayer. I realize some of you are at home, or you may be at work, or you may be in groups throughout the country, but wherever you are, could we just pause for a moment and ask for God's direction and God's guidance over us today? So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Most high and glorious God, you deserve all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. You deserve it because you are so good to us, and we want to say thank you. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, which indeed is upon us today. Give us the strength throughout this webinar to be inspired, but also informed, that we may go out and do the work of justice to serve your church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, Queen of the Apostles, pray for us. St. Vincent Pilati, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I invoke Our Lady and St. Vincent because they're the patrons of this wonderful center. And once again, I encourage you to, to access the center's website and see all the wonderful things the Catholic Apostolate Center offers to spread the gospel throughout our country and throughout our world. I want to structure our time together in the following way. Basically, what, so what, and now what? What, so what, and now what? Well, the what is indeed the, the National Black Catholic Congress movement. And I indeed call it a movement because it is something that's been taking place in our church for a long time. We'll notice here in our slide, since 1889, that we've been coming together as an African-American Catholic community Yes, to celebrate and to rejoice, to see each other, but most importantly, to do the work of justice. We come from a long, long legacy of our people who always un understood that we were not a problem to be solved, but a gift to be shared with our church. And every Congress, from way back in those ancient days until our last gathering we had back in July, was always about the work of justice. Think about it. African-American Catholics were the first lay community to gather together for a national gathering as we had back in 1889 at the steps of the great St. Augustine's Church here in Washington. That picture right there shows a determined band of people led by Daniel Rudd and his companions committed to the work of justice, realizing that Mother Church was ours as well as anyone else. And also a quote from Martin Luther King, which I love and I want to share with you today. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. They understood that, and they cried out of courage and resilience for justice. Many of you, I'm quite sure, have been involved in Congresses since they restarted again, uh, reignited again, and back in 1987. I was blessed to go to that Congress as a youth delegate. I was just 18 years old. And I understood, I heard that call, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, that God had sent me to go out and to share my blessings and my gifts. And all those Congresses, especially the last ones we've had for the last 30 years, have all tied together this important work of being together, seeing each other, but more importantly, the work of justice that is so important for our people. I'm quite sure many of you, because you're on this webinar today, were a part of our last gathering that we had in Orlando, Florida, back in July. You'll recall the, the wonderful speakers and workshops we had 
Cardinal Turkson, Brian Stevenson, Dr. Trish Bennett Goodley, and, and so many others who were there to, to lead us in major sessions and gatherings. What a wonderful, powerful experience it was. The beautiful liturgies we had, we truly knew that the church was alive. You'll see from this image we see here of the, our young people who came to Orlando, seated there with Cardinal Turkson, one of our Vatican officials. Another part of our Congress experience was our spiritual life, and the, the wonderful liturgies we had in the time of prayer, adoration, and confession. So many of you responded to what Father Cornelius said, give me some of that. I had a lady who actually came up to me and said, Father, give me some of that. I said, what do you want? She says, I want this, the sacrament of reconciliation and penance. What a blessing it was. And this beautiful image that was the backdrop of our Congress gathering reminded us that we are indeed a people of faith and a people of action. Those saints and those holy people gathered around Our Lady reminds us that the Spirit of the Lord is indeed upon us that our faith is alive, and we're called to be people who are active in our faith. Every Congress, every Congress gathering has always had a pastoral plan of action. These documents, rooted in sacred scripture and tradition and church teaching, give directions for our ministry as African American Catholics and all those involved with us. The pastoral plan has also inspired some significant moments in our history, such as the African American uh, Youth Bible, this wonderful document, the Bible we have here. That's uh, the Bible for my parish at St. Martin de Porres Parish, where I pastor in Philadelphia, but also the wonderful experience of the Mother of Africa Chapel right here in, in Washington, which shows Our Lady vested in who we are as a people, that beautiful space dedicated to us and for all people to see and to hear. And also the Daniel Rudd Fund and so many other issues have come forward from our time together. Congress is always a time of action as well as prayer. This past Congress was a little bit different. We invited each bishop throughout the country to select one person from their diocese to represent their diocese as a delegate. A different process. We divided them all and all of us to indeed trust the process. I'm from Philadelphia, so hence the Sixers image there. But it's so important to understand that we did not go to Congress this past one with an actual document. We had nothing. We had the spirit upon us and we had a trust that the people would come together and do the work that was asked of them. Again, Every ordinary, every local bishop was asked to send one. We had over 50 dioceses represented all throughout our country. Large dioceses and small ones were all together. And even places that did not always participate in Congress were there at the table in Orlando. What do we ask the delegates? Well, first of all, we had a webinar to help to teach them what would be expected of them to come together in Orlando. And then secondly, we asked them to meet with their local community and get the needs of the people and their concerns and bring them to the table. And then we met in sessions and we talked and we discussed and we even argued a little bit to find out what were the rest of the best issues that we wanted to present in our pastoral plan. And after a lot of prayer and discussion and work, we composed a list of priorities that came together as our pastoral plan. I want to be very, very clear as someone who's been part of Congress for 30 years, and someone who has worked on pastoral plans. This plan has come from the people. The people have voted and the people have spoken. You'll see in our next slide how the people really did work. As many of you were in sessions at your workshops, the delegates were working together. You'll see an image there of Father Reggie has his head, hand on his head. He's just praying and asking God to give us some strength. But we work together. We work together to come together to make this document our pastoral plan, alive and effective. If you do not have a copy of it, please download it, get it, read it, and more importantly, to use it. Allow me to just simply uh, read a little bit about what we wrote in our pastoral plan. The pastoral plan of action was developed by the delegates who were appointed by bishops from every diocese in the United States. These women and men brought the concerns and needs of the local communities 
and worked together to develop a list of pastoral priorities. They also prayed and listened to the major presentations of Congress. These priorities led to a preamble, which was presented and affirmed by the Assembly at the close of Congress 12. It was the intention of the delegates that every individual, parish, community, and diocese use the preamble to guide unique pastoral planning with black Catholics for the next five years. Again, what, so what, and now what? What is Congress all about? What is this great movement in our church? What happened at Congress? What happened in Orlando was so different, and most importantly now, now what? The purpose of our webinar today is to help you understand that this is a, a resource and a guide. You may say that most of this stuff makes a lot of sense, and some of it doesn't. We invite you to take this document, work together with your groups, and find out what works for you, and make it applicable in your own diocese, in your own parish, in your own community that makes sense for you and your local needs. And that is very, very important to understand that it's about the Spirit of the Lord being upon us, and now we're called to go forth and spread this good news to everyone we meet. As I mentioned before, I'm a pastor of a parish in a very challenged area in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And a woman came up to me recently, she says, Father, I want to do an expungement clinic for our community. And she explained to me what that was, and she had a group of attorneys that want to work with people who have criminal records and to help them who've come back to our community and help them get jobs, to help them to look at their records and see if possibly they can move forward in their lives. That's the work of Congress. That's actually one of the pastoral plan of action, action steps in this document that I invite you to take that same energy and strategy to go forward. Before we go into some questions and some insights into the Congress pastoral plan, I want to share with you something that came to me in prayer recently. St. Catherine Drexel of Philadelphia is one of my favorite saints. Obviously from the Archdiocese, I have great love and devotion for her, but also I was blessed to serve in the parish called Blessed Catherine Drexel in the city of Chester in my first years of priesthood. I was in Rome and the Vatican when I heard those words for the first time, St. Catherine Drexel of Philadelphia. But St. Catherine Drexel was much more than simply a lady who went around doing nice things. She was indeed a woman of the Eucharist. She said this to our sisters, which I think is important to repeat today at this webinar. She said, we go in to go out. We go in to go out. Meaning that the work that she did to establish schools and help establish parishes throughout our nation to fight against racism and, and prejudice, all that was done because she went in. She was able to found Xavier University in New Orleans, by far one of the best universities in our nation, because she went in. She was able to send out sisters on the mission band to serve people that some folks did not see as lovable and servable because she went in. It was her time before the Blessed Sacrament, her time in prayer each day that allowed her to have the energy to go forward to do justice. Our pastoral plans theme is on purpose. The Spirit of the Lord is indeed upon us. God loves us and God has touched our hearts. And because of that, we go forth to act justly, love goodness, and always walk humbly with our God. At this time, I'd like to um, go over some of the strategies in the pastoral plan and also to uh, take some questions. So if you're ready to start typing some questions in, I'll try my best to, to answer them as, as soon as I can. The first pastoral strategy that came from the people was um, this action step that I think is very, very important. It says to each one of us to recommit ourselves to become a better Catholic by word and action, to consider going to Mass more often, perhaps daily Mass in addition to Sunday Mass, monthly confession, time before the Blessed Sacrament and Bible study, ways that we can indeed strengthen our own spirituality. Someone asks, how is that and why is it an action step? Because that means that if my faith is alive and I'm indeed touched by the Lord, spending maybe just 15 minutes with God, giving my heart to the Lord, as St. Francis de Sales often challenged us to do, I can indeed go out and share my gifts and my blessings with other people. Another action step is to be involved in prison ministry. 
I've been blessed in my life as a priest to be a mentor for someone who's come back to our community from being incarcerated. Indeed, it's touched my heart to help him on the road to being the fine young man that he is today. Another action step would be in your parish to partner with another parish, perhaps a parish in the suburbs or a different racial background, and have that dialogue and action to break down the barriers of racism that divides our world so sadly today. Another action step, be involved in, um, in, in, in the domestic violence healing and also being involved in other ways of human trafficking, these ills that affect our world today. It's all in our pastoral plan for us to sit together and work together to do the work of justice for our people today and always. We have some questions already coming in that I want to uh, try my best to answer as they come in to us. And the first one looks like it comes in from Mary from New Orleans, from New Orleans. And she says, um, why is the pastoral plan called pastoral? Well, Mary, it's a very good question. Um, the word pastoral talks about, always about people. It's about serving the people, pastoring people. People often call me pastor because my ultimate role as, as a priest and as a pastor is to lead God's people closer to Christ and to each other. So the pastoral plan is indeed a pastoral document meant to serve the people. It's meant to help them in their life, in their prayer life, in their spiritual life, and to become the very best that God wants them to be. And so we've always called the pastoral plan, pastoral plan of action because it's meant to be something that's not just on your shelf, but actually worked and used in a, you know, your own specific way. Another question here, Tiffany from Chicago asked the question, how does racism play out in the pastoral plan? Well, actually, Tiffany, uh, we actually say in our preamble that we commit ourselves uh, to dismantle uh, racism because we know it is an, indeed um, it's a terrible sin against our soul as Americans and as God's people. And so it, it does talk specifically about racism, responding to what we heard uh, at Congress. Um, one of our major speakers talked about how we're called to indeed um, dismantle anything that is uh, not part of who we are as God's people. And so again, racism is indeed mentioned uh, in the pastoral plan, as always, talking about the dignity of all human life. The question here from Louise from Boston. I should not answer a question because that's where the Patriots play, and I'm an Eagles fan, but I will answer it anyway, just joking. Um, Louise, her question is, um, how many action steps should I cover in a year? Well, Louise, it's a very good question as well. Uh, again, that's based upon what you or your parish or your diocese wants to, to work on. I know people are already doing work themselves right now. So whatever you think is best, uh, there's no specific number you have to cover. It's not a test or anything, uh, but it's meant to be uh, prioritized. I know in our parish uh, here in Philadelphia, um, this uh, pastoral plan is being uh, looked at, and, and we're looking at specific things we're pulling out for our own parish and diocese. For me, as a pastor, we're looking at young adults as one of our major concerns in our parish. And so that's one way you can certainly um, move the pastoral plan forward that fits your own needs. Okay. Lenora from Washington, D.C., uh, she has a question here. How will, how will progress be measured over the next five years, and how can it be accomplishments be shared? Again, uh, there is no test we're going to give you for progress. Um, again, we pay, uh, bounce it back to you and say, what do you want to accomplish? Uh, what do you think is best? We've given you a guideline and a resource in this pastoral plan, and, and, and I encourage you just to take it and, and make it your own, and, and, and you can certainly share your accomplishments with whomever you see fit. Um, my hope and my prayer is we come back together in five years at our next Congress, and we would be able to share many things that we've accomplished. But again, it's meant to be what is best for your own local community. Okay. We're taking questions live now, so if you have something to ask, uh, just please go ahead and, and, and ask that question. All right, great. Good question here. This has come in from... Uh, Brandon. Brandon asked a question, what if my bishop did not send a delegate? Well, Brandon, um, 
And that did happen. Uh, again, uh, we sent letters to, uh, Bishop Ricard sent a letter to all uh, the dioceses in our nation, and a, a large portion of them did respond affirmatively, but some did not, some did not. And in fact, uh, part of our, our challenge as we had those sessions in Orlando for the delegates were people who did not have a letter, did not have any information at all from their local bishop. And we tried our best to accommodate and be flexible because some people, to no fault of their own, did not have the information before them. Um, that should not impede you uh, from doing the work. Uh, so please, uh, Brandon, just simply download the pastoral plan, uh, read it yourself, and then come together and, and do the work. And um, back to the lady with the expungement clinic at St. Martin's, if I had said no to that, and, and I wouldn't, but if I had said no to her request to, to have that program in our church hall, uh, she could have certainly still done it in the school down the street, in a community center, in a library. If her faith was telling her that I want to help those who have been beaten down by incarceration and, and help to lift them up, and I would be a, an obstacle or a block to that, she could still do the work of justice. So we are a people of resilience, and we can never let anyone get in the way uh, of what God has told us to do. One of my favorite gospel stories is, uh, you may recall, where Jesus is preaching in a, in a home, and there's so many people in the house, and a man who is sick, they're trying to bring him to Jesus, and they can't get in. Imagine having a church that full, you can't get into the, get actually inside the building. What did they do? They didn't walk away and say, oh, well, we tried. What they did was they tore the roof off and lowered the man down from the roof and got him to Jesus. That's the resilience of African-American Catholics. That's who we are as a people. That's our gift, is that many times doors front, back, side have been closed to us, and yet we were able still to... Um, to tear the roof off and bring people to Jesus. And so this encouraged us not to be deterred by uh, a lack of enthusiasm. The question here, I was not at the last Congress, but how can I, all black Catholic churches, get a hard copy of the pastoral plan? Good question. I believe if you go to the Congress website, just look up National Black Catholic Congress. You can download the plan. It is very, uh, it's very small on purpose. Um, simply get a copy of it electronically or print it out like I have here and you can take it and read it and, and move forward. Again, it's a very different kind of document. In the past we had very bulky documents and we, on purpose, this was meant to be something very usable and, and very um, to be able to give out to people and to be used in, in, in the most effective way. So uh, it's not meant to be difficult to get a copy of it. All right, great. Thank you so much for that question. Okay, another question here. Um, Coming in from Lizette from Baltimore. Lizette asked a question about young adults. Again, um, we, we, we talk about that in our preamble, in our uh, priorities, talk about the importance of our young adults. And I think what's most important about that, um, I said specifically, we commit ourselves to listen and respond to the needs of youth and young adults in our community as we seek to pass on our legacy of faith. I think, first of all, is that it's important to understand that um, youth and young adults, we know, are distinct groups and that they're, uh, we oftentimes lump them all together. But um, we have to be very attentive to um, the needs of those specific groups together. And also, the word listen is meant to be on purpose. Again, back to my own experience as a pastor, uh, our parish council um, is asking me to do a listening session with young adults people in their 20s and 30s, that critical mass of the church, and says, Father, just listen to what they have to say. Uh, obviously, there's certain things that I can't change about the church, but I can certainly listen to their needs and try to help them to find ways to evangelize. And so I, I want to thank you for that question. We have to always be in listen mode, and I think it's very, very important that, that we in leadership of the church uh, are attentive to the needs of the people in front of us, especially our young people, because they are indeed not just the future, but the present reality of our church, and that's so important. This past, uh, last week with the pro-life uh, march and movement this past in, in Washington, we see some of those young people involved in that great march for life, and, and indeed reminding us the gift of life is so sacred and so important. Question here, how do I implement the plan in a diocese which is spread out and where there's very few or no black Catholics? Great question, great, great question. I was in the diocese of, uh, Archdiocese of Omaha uh, last week uh, to give a talk, and I met with and had some chance to be with the wonderful people there in Omaha. And similar to what you're asking, they are a smaller diocese when it comes to African-American Catholics, but they're vibrant and they're alive. 
and they're ready to work. And in fact, I think they're on the, uh, the webinar right now. They actually are reading the pastoral plan and discussing it with their bishop. And so what a wonderful gift to show, again, we have to uh, get the document and work together. We're working with black Catholics or others. It doesn't matter. Uh, this is about how do we spread the gospel and spread the good news. And so I encourage you to um, find those in your local community, wherever they may be, and also be willing to cross dioceses and, and, and state lines to come together. Maybe say, you know, let's have a little regional conference out here in this area. We don't have many parishes, but let's come together as a states in this part of our country and work together. And again, the, the Congress office can be a great resource for, for giving you names of speakers and helping you to bring that together for yourself. But again, don't let uh, numbers be a deterrent for you. Good question. Thank you so much for that. Question here says, um, who is the plan for? Well, again, uh, the question was, uh, that, that the, the plan was written for everyone, you say. Uh, so if you are a pastor, if you are um, a school principal, or you are a parishioner in the pew, if you're a bishop, uh, whatever your role may be, if you have um, those of us who are concerned about the needs of the church and the needs of, of African Americans, um, this plan is meant to help you and to be a guide and resource for you. So it's written with a very wide scope, not for anyone specifically, but for all people to have some way they can engage the community and be involved in some form or fashion. So that was the intention and, and the plan of this particular plan of action. It was done, again, by the people. Uh, I reinforced it again because uh, this came from the people. And again, those strategies were, were the work the delegates did after Congress. They sent in more information and, and had listening sessions in their diocese. And that made us go from the preamble to the full document and the action steps that you see before you today. Again, based upon prayer and spirituality and also the work of justice that are always linked together. So important to have those two understood um, simultaneously. We have time for a couple more questions. Let me see uh, who is uh, asking us for questions now. Here. All right. Now we have a blueprint, uh, a resource guide. Um, how do we narrow down the, the millions of ministries in the world and find ways to address them? Challenging question, I, I, I invite you to, to uh, wherever that question, wherever you're asking that question for, just really think about it as, as, as smaller pieces. Uh, we, we can't obviously address millions of ministries throughout the world, but what's in your heart? Are you really called, do you feel, to, to mentor a young person? Do you really feel called to work on human trafficking? Do you feel called to work on vocations? Um, our wonderful holy people. Um, these prayer cards that we have that were given to us um, at the last Congress. We have five... Um, Five women and men who are, whose cases are opened uh, for canonization. And, and by God's grace, um, a single person, a married person, two consecrated religious women, an ordained priest. That's the, the vocation of our church, that all of us are called to holiness. And, and these uh, holy people, uh, we need to not just... Uh, learn about them, but also spread uh, their story because their story is a story of resilience and love for the church. Um, Father Augustus Tolton would have never been able to do what he did uh, and be the man that he was if he didn't know that God loved him. The chains of slavery could never shackle his soul because he knew so well that he was indeed God's child. So I encourage you to, to define your niche um, St. Francis Sales, uh, again, his speech this past week, he says, be who you are and be that well. So whatever you feel called to to serve in the church, do that and do it to the best of your ability. How do Catholics that live in parishes that are not plugged into Congress at the parish level participate par parishioners at the Congress level? Again, another good question. We find that sometimes that most of our, many of our black Catholics do not live in quote unquote black parishes or do not worship there. So again, I invite you just to have that conversation with uh, your pastor, your leadership there. Um, on the Congress website, which is a great resource for all these things, uh, you can find out where other parishes are, uh, find out what they're doing, and, and don't be afraid to collaborate. That's so important. Again, today is the Feast of uh, Timothy and Titus, who are great collaborators with St. Paul. So we have to be willing to, to share ideas, visit parts of our country, and be willing to, to share the good news as we, as we see it uh, throughout the world. So again, I encourage you just to find what's going on in other places and, and try your best to bring those ideas back. One of the things, again, we have at St. Martin's, I'm trying to be uh, relevant to my own experience as a pastor on the ground, um, is Family and Friends Day, an idea that I found 
some other, other parish did it. And now we do it at St. Martin's. It's a wonderful experience every fall where people bring, I say, give me five, yourself and four others, uh, to come to Mass. Our church is full. And, and every year we get a chance to, to grow our numbers. And this year we worked on um, justice issues. We had tables in the back of church where people could really get involved, to go from the altar to the street and get involved in ministries. Again, it flowed out of the pastoral plan of Congress. So uh, to me, another great idea that I learned from someone else. Where does Congress see its role in black Catholic youth and young adults in the next five years? Again, our young people is a great concern for myself uh, as a pastor. Uh, and as someone who teaches at university, I work with college students as well in the archdiocese. And um, again, I, I'm concerned because uh, we have to continue to encourage our young people uh, to, to need the Lord and to want the Lord and be involved in church. And, uh, and that's a both end. Uh, part of that also is for us as adults to, to make some space. Um, for them and so they have to move from the leadership role to the mentor role or the leadership role or the chair role to a role of, of, of emeritus and, and ways that you can uh, pass on your knowledge and your legacy and bring somebody else along. Uh, I think mentoring is, is a key issue. So if we're going to have our young people involved in the church and I'm a person who believe the best is yet to come, that God has a blessing for us uh, for our future, I believe the church is alive. And so that's only going to happen uh, by us uh, being more um, intentional about our young people, their needs, and, and, and these movements today among youth that are so critical. The church has to listen. The church has to respond uh, in an affirmative way. Will the Congress office have a feature or use uh, or for us to use as best practices on national level? Um, great question as well. Um, we do not have any specific plans uh, for um, any kind of a, uh, a feature, but um, we can certainly share those best practices. I encourage you to uh, send them in to the office, and perhaps we can put them as, as a feature on uh, the monthly website and, and use it out to, to, to share those good news from people. Um, but again, the more we can do good things and try to pass them around with each other, that's one of the ways we can spread uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay? I think we are about finished. And I want to thank everyone for being here today on this webinar and a few closing comments but before we go. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. The Center will have a recording of this webinar uploaded on their YouTube channel next week and a link on their web webinar page. Please visit catholicapostolatecenter.org. Again, catholicapostolatecenter.org and the mbccongress.org for more information. We thank you today and may God bless you. And before we go, um, once again, thank you for being with us today. Um, stay in prayer, uh, stay collaborative, stay awake, and always believe uh, that God loves you and the best is yet to come. Amen. Amen.